Whoa, I'm running short of words right now, but I cannot afford this because I have to speak. Thank you so much for all the love, for all the warmth. Thank you for accepting me. Thank you very much. Well, I always start my talk with a disclaimer. And that disclaimer is that I've never claimed to be a motivational speaker. Yes, I do speak, but I feel more like a storyteller because wherever I go, I share a story with everyone. Well, it is a story of a woman whose perfectly imperfect life made her who and what she is today. It's the story of a woman who in pursuit of her dreams and aspirations made other people realize that if you think that your life is hard and you're giving up on that because you think your life is unfair, think again. Because when you think that way, you are being unfair to your own self. It's the story of a woman who made people realize that sometimes problems are not too big. We are too small because we cannot handle them. It is the story of a woman who with time realized that real happiness doesn't lie in success, money, fame. It lies within. Real happiness lies in gratitude. So I am here and I'm going to share the story of that woman. That is my story. The story of gratitude. I love you too. I love you all. I believe in the power of words. Many people speak before they think, but I know the value of words. The words can make you, break you, they can heal your soul, they can damage you forever. So I always try to use the positive words in my life wherever I go. They call it adversity, I call it opportunity. They call it weakness, I call it strength. They call me disabled, I call myself differently abled. They see my disability. They see my disability, I see my ability. There are some incidents that happen in your life. And those incidents are so strong that they change your DNA. Those incidents or accidents are so strong that they break you physically. They deform your body, but they transform your soul. Those incidents break you, deform you, but they mold you into the best version of you. And the same thing happened to me. And I'm going to share what exactly happened to me. I was 18 years old when I got married. And this thing I'm sharing for the very first time on an international level. I was 18 years old when I got married. I belonged to a very conservative family, a Baloch family where Good daughters never say no to their parents. My father wanted me to get married. And all I said was, if that makes you happy, I'll say yes. And of course, it was never a happy marriage. Just about after two years of getting married, about nine years ago, I met a car accident. Somehow my husband fell asleep and the car fell in the ditch. He managed to jump out, saved himself. I'm happy for him. But I stayed inside the car and I sustained a lot of injuries. The list is a bit long. Don't get scared. I'm perfectly fine now. The radius ulna of my right arm were fractured. The wrist was fractured. Shoulder bone and collarbone were fractured. My whole rib cage got fractured. And because of the rib cage injury, lungs and liver were badly injured. I couldn't breathe. 
I lost urinal bowel control. That's why I have to wear the bag wherever I go. But that injury that changed me and my life completely as a person and my perception towards living my life was the spine injury. Three vertebra of my backbone were completely crushed and I got paralyzed for the rest of my life. So this accident took place in a far flung area in the outskirts of a very small province, Balochistan, where there was no first aid, no hospital, no ambulance. I was in the middle of nowhere in that toppled car. Many people came to rescue. They gave me CBR. They dragged me out of the car. And while they were dragging me out, I got the complete transaction of my spinal cord. And now there was this debate going on. Should we keep it here? She's going to die. Where should we go? There is no ambulance. There was this four wheeler Jeep standing in the corner of the street. They said, put her in the back of the Jeep and take her to the hospital, which is three hours away from this place. And I still remember that bumpy ride. I was all broken. They threw me at the back of the Jeep and they rushed me to the hospital. That is where I realized that my half body was fractured and half was paralyzed. I finally ended up in a hospital where I stayed for two and a half months. I underwent multiple surgeries. Doctors have put a lot of titanium in my arm. There's a lot of titanium at my back to fix my back. That's why people in Pakistan call me the Iron Lady of Pakistan. Sometimes I wonder how easy it is for me to describe all this all over again. And somebody has rightly said that when you share your story and it doesn't make you cry, that means you have healed. Those two and a half months in the hospital were dreadful. I will not make up stories just to inspire you. I was at the verge of despair. One day doctor came to me and he said, well, I heard that you wanted to be an artist, but you ended up being a housewife. I have a bad news for you. You won't be able to paint again because your wrist and your arm are so deformed. You won't be able to hold a pen again. And I stayed quiet. Next day, doctor came to me and said, your spine injury is so bad, you won't be able to walk again. I took a deep breath and I said, it's all right. The next day, doctor came to me and said, because of your spine injury and the fixation that you have in your back, you won't be able to give birth to a child again. That day, I was devastated. I still remember, I asked my mother, why me? And that is where I started to question my existence. That why am I even alive? What's the point of living? I cannot walk, I cannot paint, fine. I cannot be a mother. And we have this thing in our heads being women that we are incomplete without having children. I am going to be an incomplete woman for the rest of my life. What's the point? People are scared. They think I will get divorced. What is going to happen to me? Why me? Why am I alive? We all try to chase this tunnel. We all do this because we see light in the end of the tunnel, which keeps us going. My dear friends, in my situation, there was a tunnel that I had to roll on, but there was no light. And that is where I realized that the words have the power to heal the soul. My mother said to me, this too shall pass. God has a greater plan for you. I don't know what it is, but he surely has. And in all that distress and grief, somehow or the other, those words were so magical that they kept me going. I was trying to put that smile on my face all the time, was hiding. It was so hard to hide the pain, which was there. But all I knew was that if I will give up, my mother and my brothers will give up too. 
I cannot see them crying with me. So what kept me going was, one day I asked my brothers, I know I have a deformed hand, but I'm tired of looking at these white walls in the hospital and wearing these white scrubs. I'm getting tired of this. I want to add more colors to my life. I want to do something. Bring me some colors. Bring me some small canvas. I want to paint. So the very first painting I made was on my deathbed, where I painted for the very first time. It was not just an art piece or just my passion. It was my therapy. What an amazing therapy it was. Without uttering a single word, I could paint my heart out. I could share my story. People used to come and say, what lovely painting, so much color. Nobody could see the grief in it, only I could. So that's how I spent two and a half months in my hospital, crying, never complaining or whining, but painting. And then I was discharged and I went back home. And I went back home and I realized that I have developed a lot of pressure ulcers on my back and on my hip bone. I was unable to sit. There were a lot of infections in my body, a lot of allergies. So doctors wanted me to lie down on the bed straight for not six months, for not one year, for two years. I was bedridden, confined in that one room, looking outside the window, listening to the birds chirping and thinking maybe there will be a time when we'll be going out with the family and enjoying the nature. That was the time where I realized how lucky people are, but they don't realize. That is the time where I realized that the day I'm going to sit, I'm going to share this pain with everyone to make them realize how blessed they are and they don't even consider them lucky. There are always turning points in your life. There was a rebirth day that I celebrated. After two years and two and a half months, when I was able to sit on a wheelchair, that was the day when I had the rebirth. I was a completely different person. I still remember the day I sat on the wheelchair for the first time, knowing that I'm never going to leave this, knowing that I won't be able to walk for the rest of my life. I saw myself in the mirror and I talked to myself. And I still remember what I said. I cannot wait for a miracle to come and make me walk. I cannot sit in the corner of the room crying, cribbing and begging for mercy because nobody has time. So I have to accept myself the way I am. The sooner the better. So I applied the lip color for the first time. And I erased it. And I cried and I said, what am I doing? A person on a wheelchair should not do this. What will people say? Clean it up, put it again. This time I put it for myself because I wanted to feel perfect from within. And that day I decided that I'm going to live life for myself. I am not going to be that perfect person for someone. I am just going to take this moment and I will make it perfect for myself. And you know how it all began? That day I decided that I'm going to fight my fears. We all have fears. Fear of unknown, fear of known, fear of losing people, fear of losing health, money, we want to excel in career, we want to become famous, we want to get money. We are scared all the time. So I wrote down one by one all those fears and I decided that I'm going to overcome these fears one at a time. Do you know what was my biggest fear? Divorce. I couldn't stand this word. I was trying to cling on to this person who didn't want me anymore, but I said, no, I have to make it work. But the day I decided that this is nothing but my fear, I liberated myself by setting him free. 
And I made myself emotionally so strong that the day I got the news that he's getting married, I sent him a text that I'm so happy for you and I wish you all the best. And he knows that I pray for him today. My biggest fear, number two, was I won't be able to be a mother again. And that was quite devastating for me. But then I realized there are so many children in the world, all they want is acceptance. So there is no point of crying, just go and adopt one. And that's what I did. I gave my name in different organizations, different orphanages. I didn't mention that I'm on a wheelchair, dying to have a child. So I just told them that this is Muniba Mazari and she wants to adopt a boy or girl whatsoever, but I want to adopt a kid. And I waited patiently. Two years later, I got this call from a very small city in Pakistan. I got a call and they said, are you Muniba Mazari? There is a baby boy and would you like to adopt? And when I say yes, I could literally feel the labor pain. I said, yes, yes, I am going to adopt him. I am coming to take him home. And when I reached there, the man was sitting and he was looking at me from head to toe. And in back of my head, I kept thinking that, oh my God, he is going to say she's on the wheelchair. She doesn't deserve it. How is she going to take care of him? And I looked at him and I said, do not judge me because I'm on the wheelchair. But you know what he said? He said, I know you will be the best mother of this child. You both are lucky to have each other. And that day, I was two years old, two days old, and today he's six. <laughs> you will be surprised to know another bigger fear that I had in me. It was facing people. I used to hide myself from people. When I was on bed for two years, I used to keep the door closed. I used to pretend that I'm not going to meet anyone, tell them that I'm sleeping. You know why? Because I couldn't stand that sympathy that they had for me. They used to treat me like a patient. When I used to smile, they used to look at me and say that, you're smiling, are you okay? I was tired of this question being asked, are you sick? Well, a lady yesterday at the airport asked me, are you sick? And I said, well, um, besides the spinal cord injury, I'm fine, I guess. Those are really cute questions. They never used to feel cute when I was on the bed. So I used to hide myself from people, knowing that, oh my God, I'm not going to see that sympathy in their eyes. It's all right. And today I'm here speaking to all these amazing people because I have overcome the fear. You know, when you end up being on the wheelchair, What's the most painful thing? That's another fear that people on the wheelchair or the people who are differently able have in their hearts, but they never share. I'll share that with you. The lack of acceptance. People think that they will not be accepted by other people because we, in the world of perfect people, are imperfect. So I decided that instead of starting an NGO for disability awareness, which I know will not help anyone, I started to appear more in public. I started to paint. I always wanted to. I have done a lot of exhibitions. I'm Pakistan's first wheelchair-bound artist. I have done a lot of modeling campaigns, different campaigns for brands like Tony and Guy. I have done some really funny breaking the barriers kind of modeling. There was this one by the name Clown Town where I became a clown because I know that clowns have hearts too. Then I also decided that if I really want to make the difference, I am not going to let people use me for their polio campaigns where they will make you a victim at an emblem of misery and mercy and will say that, you know what, give polio drops to your children or they'll become like this girl. I decided that I'm going to join the national TV of Pakistan as an anchor person. And I've been doing a lot of shows for the last three years. So 
So when you accept yourself the way you are, the world recognizes you. It all starts from within. I became, thank you. I became the National Goodwill Ambassador for you and women, Pakistan, and now I speak for the rights of women, children. We talk about inclusion, diversity, gender equality, which is a must. I was featured in BBC 100 Women for 2015. I'm one of the Forbes 30 under 30 for 2016. And it all didn't happen alone. You all are thriving in your careers. You have bigger dreams and aspirations in life. Always remember one thing. On the road to success, there is always we, not me. Do not think that you alone can achieve things. No. There is always another person who is standing behind you, maybe not coming on the forefront, but behind you, praying for you and supporting you. Never lose that person. Never. No matter how much I say that I couldn't find a hero, so I became one, I still want to recognize those three people in my life who literally changed my life completely. And I get inspiration from them every single day. Walid Khan. Many people know about the terrorist attacks in Pakistan. We have lost many people. And I'm sharing this with a very heavy heart because we actually have lost a lot of people in this huge turmoil of terrorism. These people are barbarians. They do not see people. They are, they are, they are even worse than animals. They have killed people in mosques. They have killed people in churches, temples, even in schools. There was this terrorist attack in army public school Peshawar where these terrorists entered in an examination hall and they killed our children. And in that attack, that day, this beautiful boy, Walid Khan, who was my hero, my real life hero, was the proctor who was taking care of the students, was keeping an eye on the students. Those barbarians shot him three times in the face, five times on his body, and he fell down. I was asked to give a talk in the school after a week of that terrorist attack. With a very heavy heart, I went there and I spoke. We sang a few national songs. I thought that maybe I've done my part, but deep inside, it was killing me. I could see children injured. I could see children sitting on the wheelchairs, looking at me, wondering, what next? What was our fault? Just because we were here to give examination, we have been shot. So many people, so many children lost their friends. Their classrooms were empty the next day they went to the classroom. So this kid, Walid Khan, I was asked that he is in, in a hospital right now and you have to go and see him and motivate him and tell him that it's going to be okay. And when I saw Walid Khan coming on the wheelchair for the first time in front of me, his face was all deformed. His leg was fractured, his arm was fractured. He couldn't talk, he lost his teeth. He cannot sneeze, he cannot smell. He cannot eat. And I kept thinking, what should I say? That everything is going to be all right? No, nothing is all right. And while I was juggling with the words, what to say, what not to say, this beautiful child, Walid Khan, came to me and he said, are you Muniba Mazari? I said, yes. He said, Baji, let's take a selfie. <laughs> and with that beautiful toothless smile of Walid Khan, we took that beautiful selfie that I still have with me. I don't share that here because he was in a very bad shape that time. And that is where I realized that when I was thinking too much about his deformities, He's happy with himself. He doesn't even care. Because today he goes in the same school. And when somebody asks him that what happened to your face, why so many scars? You know what he says? These scars are my medals and I wear them with pride. <laughs> and 
and how beautifully he says the terrorists wanted me not to study. I am going to study. I will become a doctor one day. And this is my way of taking revenge from those terrorists. <laughs> Another li real life hero, of course, my son. His name is Nile, N-I-L-E, River Nile. I learned so much from this kid. The first and foremost thing is patience. How to be patient when you know that your mother cannot walk, when you know that your mother is different from the other women, when you know that your mother cannot go out and play with you, how to stay calm. He loves football. And when we got the very first football, he was four years old. He was super excited. I still remember he came in the room and he said, mom, let's play football and he kept the ball in my feet. And he said, let's kick it. And that day I felt disabled. I said, I cannot kick the ball. And I was down with the same face. He looked at me and he said, well, that's all right. Your legs are not working, but your hands do. Let's play catch the ball. You know what, that day he made me realize that when you think your glass is half empty, come on, your glass is half full. It's all in here and here. <laughs> Last but not least, the woman who made me realize that heroes have no gender. The woman who believed in me even when I was completely at the verge of despair where everybody left, she was there. And every time I looked at her without saying anything, she used to look at me and said, this too shall pass. God has a bigger plan. And one day you will say that, oh my God, that is why God has chosen me. She never cried in front of me. She has always said that there will be haters, there will be naysayers, there will be disbelievers, and then there will be you proving them wrong. My mother. Whatever I am today, I'm nothing without her. I'm nothing without her. Thank you, Mama. I wish you were here. Thank you for making me who I am today. You know what? We human beings have a problem. Out of many problems, there is one more. And this is self-created one. We always expect ease from life. We have this amazing fantasy about life. This is how things should work. This is my plan. It should go as per my plan. If that doesn't happen, we give up. So my dear friends, let me tell you one thing. I never wanted to be on the wheelchair. Never thought of being on the wheelchair. I was always aspiring to do bigger things, but had no idea that for that I have to pay the price to be where I am today. It's a very heavy price. This life is a test and a trial, and tests are trials are never supposed to be easy. So when you are expecting ease from life, and life gives you lemons, then you make the lemonade, and then do not blame life for that, because you were expecting ease from a trial. Trials make you a stronger, better person. Life is a trial. Every time you realize that. It is okay to be scared. It is okay to cry. Everything is okay, but giving up should not be an option. They always say that failure is not an option. Failure should be an option because when you fail, you get up and then you fail and then you get up and that keeps you going. That's how humans are strong. <laughs> Failure is an option, should be an option, but giving up is not, never. We have this thing in minds, we call it perfection. We want everything perfect. 
We want ourselves to be perfect. There is this image in our head about everything. Perfect life, perfect relationships, perfect career, perfect amount of money that we need to earn no matter what. Nothing is perfect in this world. We all are perfectly imperfect and that is perfectly all right. That's all right. You were, we were sent here not to become the perfect people. Those people who tell you how to look perfect, even those people are imperfect. Trying to fight this fear of looking imperfect. I used to be perfect. I still remember. I got this compliment years ago when I used to walk. Oh my God, look at you. You're fair. You're tall. You're perfect. Look at me now. Only the perfect eyes can see that. Only the perfect eyes will see that. Only the perfect eyes will see that. So yes, in all those imperfections, you have to listen to your heart. You don't have to look good for people. You don't have to be perfect just because other people want you to, to be perfect. If your soul is perfect from within, that's all right. This is all what you want. This is all what you need to be. Our society has made very weird, very weird kind of norms to look perfect and great. For men, it's different. For women, it's different. We think too much about what people say. We, we listen to ourselves too little. You know what makes you perfect? when you make someone smile. You know what makes you perfect? When you try to do something good for the people around you. You know what makes you perfect? When you feel someone's pain. And how beautiful pain is that it connects you with people. No other medium can connect you with others but pain. That's why I always say that I'm in pain and that's a blessing in disguise for me. Today, Just because I'm in pain and I'm on the wheelchair, I work for children. Being the head of CSR for a company. We conduct medical camps in far-flung areas of Pakistan where so many kids die because they don't have medical facilities. And I personally believe just because they cannot afford to live doesn't mean we let them die. So we give them money, we give them medical treatment, we try to heal their wounds, physical and emotional. And I also work for the beautiful people. We call them third gender. The transgender community of Pakistan. You know what connects me with them? All my imperfections. When I go and I hug them, they never judge me. And this very good friend of mine, her name is Bijli. Bijli means electricity. She calls herself electricity. And I said, are you electricity? She says, no, I'm lightning. I'm as strong as lightning. <laughs> because, we have, because we have very bad power outage, so she doesn't want me to call her electricity. So she says, I am very strong. I'm thunder, I'm lightning. She came to me and the first time I hugged her, she said, you are just like me. And I said, yes, I am like you. Because to people we are so imperfect. So how beautiful these imperfections are that because of these imperfections you can connect with people. Then why are we all running after being perfect? What's the point? Every time I go in public, I always smile. It's always a big toothy smile on my face and people ask me, don't you get tired of smiling all the time? What's the secret? I always say one thing, that I have stopped worrying about the things that I have lost, the people that I have lost. Things and people who were meant to be with me are with me. And sometimes, somebody's absence makes you a better person. Cherish their absence. It's always, it's always.